finish my consideration of the meaning of the phrase in use for commercial purposes, let me address some uh, remaining arguments made by the Republic. Uh, for the most part, I think I've addressed them, but let me just... The Republic argues that if the cargo had any use at all in 1942, it was to produce coins or currency for the Union government, which was a sovereign purpose. With the utmost respect, that is an unfounded assumption. The minting of coins is only relevant to determining the intended use of the silver. We're here dealing with the silver's actual use at the time of the sinking. Its actual use was plainly commercial, and the judge rightly rejected that third contention and concluded that the cargo was not only in use but in use for commercial <coughs> purposes and he referred with approval to the uh, decision in the Alta <coughs> and he said also uh, paragraph 157 of the judgment that the principles underlying the law of salvage also supported this conclusion a claim in salvage is based upon a successful salvage service for which the owner derives a benefit. Uh, and, and furthermore, the fact that the silver may have been intended for use as part of sovereign activity producing government coinage uh, did not affect its status uh, as in use for commercial purposes. And I've made that submission. Uh, so the court found that the cargo to be in use for commercial purposes in 1942, uh, and this was relevant to its categorization in 2017 uh, and the judge then went on to conclude that he had no reason to conclude that the character of the cargo in the intervening period had changed paragraph 142 he was right but I'll come back to that in a moment the Republic also argued that the cargo was not in use because once the ship uh, was sunk the commercial contracts came to an end and with them the commercial character of the cargo and I've dealt with that extensively <coughs> Um, the, let me wrap up on this issue by dealing with the um, Republic's contention that the judge's conclusion that the silver was in use in 1942 for commercial purposes, for the commercial purpose of being carried under a contract of carriage, was driven by three points of impression which do not stand withstand scrutiny, uh, and that was set out at paragraphs 31. 33 in their original scope of judgment. Um, uh, only some of them uh, were addressed uh, orally, but let me deal with them quickly uh, in turn. The first was that in most cases, <coughs> a ship will be in use rather than intended for use, and cargo will be intended for use rather than in use. Uh, and it's said that the judge's first false impression was the concern that unless Section 10.4a was read in a strained fashion. Very few, if any, cargoes would be in use. Uh, and the Republic's contention is that the suggestion that in use must be read in a way that it makes it applicable to cargoes that are not in fact in use at all ignores that the phrase in use or intended for use applies both to ship and cargo. Uh, well, I've already explained why in our submission the silver was in fact in use for commercial and so in our submission, the um, Republic's argument is based on a false premise. But the contention is, uh, in any event, uh, misconceived for three reasons. The contention is textually problematic. It denies any practical meaning at all to in use with respect to cargo. Uh, and the word both makes clear that the phrase in use must apply to cargo as much as the ship. Had Parliament intended the outcome for which the Republic contended, it would have been a simple matter to express that intention. Uh, second, the contention is inconsistent with the restrictive theory for the reasons set out in Benkarbush, which provides the, that immunity will only attach to a wholly sovereign act. The Republic's contention is premised on the absence of a commercial act not the presence of a sovereign act. And further, while the restrictive theory does leave it upon states to draw a line between commercial and non-commercial acts, in circumstances where the matter is unclear, it gives leeway to determine which outcome will be most consonant with the interests of justice. And in the instant case, the outcome for which we contend in no way offends the dignity of the state and it avoids the absurd results which the Republic's contention produces. Lee 
leads me neatly to the third reason why the Republic's contention is misconceived. It produces absurd results. In short, uh, if the Republic is right, then the ship and cargo must be treated differently, which is not justified by the wording of the, sta sta of the statute. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the second uh, matter of impression uh, was uh, the alleged false impression, the skeleton argument, paragraph 29.2, Four bundle divide three page three two three <coughs> was the judge's surprise that the state which entered into an FOB contract of sale and a contract of carriage contained in a way that's by a bill of lading might evade liability salvage claims. Uh, well, we can see from the uh, skeleton this gives rise to five points in the skeleton, uh, all grouped around the protest that the judge has mischaracterized the effect uh, of the grant of immunity. Uh, and the implicit assertion is that the judge mischaracterized the grant of immunity and would not have been surprised if he had properly characterized the effect of the grant of immunity. Well, the allegation is without foundation. The judge had well in mind the proper scope and effect of state immunity. Uh, the Republic relies upon five paragraphs in the judgment in support of the assertion <coughs> that the judge is guilty of mischaracterization. In our submission, one looks in vain in those paragraphs to find the allege alleged or any mischaracterization. That they are paragraph five. In that paragraph, the judge is assuming the Republic is immune from the court's adjudicative jurisdiction. And based on this assumption, it is addressing an entirely different issue which arises under the Merchant Shipping Act and which did not arise uh, on the application. The judge didn't mischaracterize the effect of the grant of immunity. Next, they relied on his paragraph 155. I, I, in this paragraph, the judge dealt with the issue of construction, the issue whether the English court has jurisdiction to adjudicate a claim. It was in considering the issue of construction that the learned judge stated that, and I quote, it would be difficult to reconcile such a conclusion, that is, the surprising conclusion that a state which, like a private enter, entity, enters into an FOB contract of sale and a contract of carriage contained in no evidence by a bill of lading, were immune from actions in REM in respect of salvage. So it would be difficult to reconcile such a conclusion with the restrictive theory of state immunity against the background of which the State Immunity Act is to be interpreted. Consistency with the restrictive theory of state immunity is a legitimate aid to construction, and there is no evidence to be derived from this paragraph that the judge mischaracterized the effect of the grant of immunity. Next paragraph 161 is relied upon. Uh, uh, once again, uh, as is evident from the very next <coughs> paragraph, <coughs> paragraph 162, the judge was here concerned with the issue of construction. The matters to which he refers in paragraph 161 are matters which he says are to be borne in mind when one is concerned with the iterative process of construction, quote, since the State Immunity Act was intended to give effect to the set restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, close quote. There is no evidence in this paragraph to suggest that the judge mischaracterized the effect of the grant of immunity. And then paragraph 164. Once again, in this paragraph, the judge is doing no more than testing each of the rival contentions as to the construction of 10, section 10 a for consistency with the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity. To test the contentions in this way is a legitimate aid to construction and does not reveal a mischaracterization of the effect <coughs> of the grant of immunity. And then finally, paragraph 170, well, the, the same point can be made in relation to this paragraph. The judge is doing no more than looking for consistency with the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, uh, which the Court of Appeal uh, in the Prestige confirmed was the correct approach. 
in this context, uh, the Republic made uh, five particular points, uh, and by reference to the judgment, uh, or, or, um, none of them seek to show on what basis it's being asserted that the judge mischaracterized the effect of the grant of immunity. Indeed, none of them even point to the judgment. I'll therefore take them very quickly. The Republic's first point is that the judge proceeded on the assumption that the issue was whether the Republic is or should be liable, whereas he should merely have determined whether the English court has jurisdiction to adjudicate on the claim. The fundamental problem with this allegation is that there is no evidence in the judgment to support it. The judge was not guilty as charged. A as he noted at paragraph 12 of the judgment, the application engages two conflicting interests, the interest of a claimant in access to justice and the interest of the Republic in being immune from the jurisdiction of the court. These two interests are to be balanced by the application of the State Immunity Act, 1978. A and later on in paragraph 155, in the course of dealing with the issue of construction, the judge noted that the issue to be addressed was whether the English court had jurisdiction to adjudicate the claim. He said it would be surprising if a state which, like any private entity, enters into such a contract were immune from actions in rem against its cargo in respect of salvage. It would be difficult to reconcile such a conclusion with the restrictive theory of state immunity against the background of which the State Immunity Act is to be interpreted. Uh, uh, again, this analysis properly characterized the Republic's plea of immunity, <coughs> which concerned the jurisdiction of the English courts uh, and not its liability to the salvage. Uh, in so doing, the judge unsurprisingly considered that ensuring consistency with the restrictive theory was a legitimate aid to construction. So for this reason, the first mischaracterization is without foundation. The, the second contention is that the claimant could have issued in personam proceedings in South Africa where no question of state immunity would have arisen. The Republic here appears to conflate state immunity with a plea of forum non convenience to assert sotto voce that merely because a claim is available in some other forum, no injustice will arise if the claim is excluded here, such that the judge should have been untroubled by the salvor being shut out of its in rem claim uh, in England. The problem with this analysis is that it once again ignores the principled foundations of state immunity. I've referred the court to Premier Congresso, uh, uh, where it might be noted the suggestion was never made that the House of Lords did not need to worry about state immunity because Cuba could be sued uh, in its own courts. Uh, at page 194, Lord Wilberforce sets out the rationale of the restrictive immunity, uh, and I've read that before. Uh, implicit in this principle discussion is the idea that the English court is not concerned with the availability of a potential claim in some other form. What it cares about is whether the claimant having established the prerequisites of a claim against the state in this forum, should be precluded from bringing that claim by virtue of state immunity. What might be possible for a claimant in some other jurisdictions is neither here nor there. Uh, more to the point, in the present case, the Republic's allegation that there was a claim available to the Salvor in South Africa is no answer at all. It's mere assertion unsupported by any evidence whatsoever. The nature of the claim is not even identified. Uh, if the Republic <coughs> wants to rely on a cause of action in South Africa as somehow ameliorating the consequences of its interpretation, it is for it to plead and prove the necessary foreign law in support, uh, and it has not bothered to do so. I I in this context, uh, let me deal with the relevance of proceedings in South Africa to whether or not salvage is due under the Merchant Shipping Act. 
question that was raised uh, during submissions uh, by my lady, Lady Justice Andrews, A4, page 1, line 25 to page 2, line 8. Uh, and the suggestion was that if the Republic is immune here and time barred in South Africa, then salvage would no longer be due. Our primary argument is that salvage is due when a useful result is achieved and the owner receives the benefit of our salvage operations as set out in the Merchant Shipping Act. Well, that must be right, but the, the question is whether it has ceased to be due, because um, I assume you make out your claim for salvage, um, but it is time barred. The time bar doesn't extinguish the, the right. You, you then couldn't, let's suppose it was a salvage claim here and there wasn't the complication of state immunity, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to say that salvage was due because um, there'd be a complete defence to your claim. Well, the assumption there is a, a court of competent jurisdiction yes. making a decision, and let me move on to deal with that. Uh, if our primary argument is rejected and the court accepts the idea that it needs to be possible for a court somewhere to determine salvage, then on our uh, salvage claim, uh, then we would rely on our salvage claim defensively. If there is going to be a dispute about whether we can rely upon it defensively, uh, for example, in the context of hypothetical delivery up proceedings brought by the state, then the question of whether we can rely on it defensively would need to be resolved before the receiver can release the cargo. Mm. But the receiver cannot safely assume or conclude that just because the time bar has expired, even if it has expired here or in other jurisdictions, that means that it is no longer possible for a court to determine salvage. I think in fairness to Mr. Smith, it was not Mr. Smith's position, it was <laughs> yes. Dr. Staker's position uh, on behalf of the receiver, and it, it would be, uh, that would be an extremely <coughs> unwise assumption to make. There is a further. Myself. Sorry. I'm Speaking entirely for myself. Yes. Th there's a further practical point. Who is it suggested will bring proceedings in the Republic? Salvors have not, and are not planning to do so. And why should the Republic bring proceedings? If none is going to bring proceedings in the Republic, a court of competent jurisdiction will never determine whether the claim in South Africa is or is not time bound. The uh, the Republic's third contention that I need to deal with is that the claimant could have issued an in personam claim against uh, the Republic and sought permission to serve out. Uh, again, the implicit assumption uh, by the Republic is that the availability of a claim in personam, in respect of which the Republic was not immune, should have been sufficient to meet the judge's concerns. Uh, I can address that briefly. If the interpretation of section 10.4a, which is consistent with the restrictive theory of immunity, leads to the conclusion that the Republic is not immune from a claim in REM, the availability of a claim in personam, in respect of which the Republic was not immune, would be neither here nor there. Further, merely because a claim may be available in personam as well as in REM, does not mean that no injustice will arise if the in rem claim is excluded. The claimant is perfectly entitled to choose to issue a claim in rem only if it, for example, wishes to take advantage of the procedural advantages available as regards the service of an in rem claim form. The claimant does not have to choose between the two. The inability to bring an in personam claim for salvage is not a precondition to bringing an in rem claim, whether or not an in personam claim is available, is therefore, in our submission, irrelevant. In any event, according to the Republic's argument, the ship was no longer in use for commercial purposes as it had become a wreck, and so it would have been immune from both a claim in personam and a claim in rem. So, in one sense, it's a, a unnecessary argument. The Republic's fourth contention is that if the judge was correct, then his approach would or logically should apply equally to any state-owned cargo carried by sea, 
including one on a state-owned ship not in commercial use. Uh, th this is not so much an allegation that the judge misunderstood state immunity as much as an assertion that his reading of Section 10.4a produces unacceptable consequences. Uh, but I can again take this point shortly. It's a strong man. The judge was commenting on the facts in front of him. At no point did he suggest that his approach would extend to, for example, military equipment <coughs> sold from a warship. As the Republic itself notes in formulating the point of impression to which it is responding, the judge was concerned with a situation in which, and I quote, a state which entered into an FOB contract of sale and a contract of carriage contained in or evidenced by the bill of lading. A, a, a state-owned cargo on a state-owned ship not in commercial use is highly unlikely to meet that description. In any event, it may well be unfair uh, to grant a state immunity from a claim for salvage of a state-owned ship not in commercial, commercial use, but that is not a reason to grant it immunity in respect of all claims for salvage, including for the salvage of ships and cargo in use for commercial purposes. The, the, the fifth and final contention, uh, which is the uh, Republic's protest that the mere fact that by shipping a cargo at sea, even on commercial terms, a state exposes itself to a risk that the cargo may require salvage services is not a reason for concluding that the state should not be entitled to immunity if the cargo is as the silver, silver was and is in all other respects not non-commercial. Uh, again, this is more to do with the consequences of the judge's approach as opposed to the approach itself somehow mischaracterizing state immunity. Again, briefly, the silver was not in all other respects not commercial, whatever that means. I I in our submission, the question can be better posed in the reverse. Where the state purchases the silver commercially and places it on board a commercial vessel, in accordance with a commercial contract of carriage and has it subjected to commercial salvage, what possible justification is there for it being granted immunity? In the absence of a single sovereign act, the answer per Lord Wilberforce is plain, absolutely none. That, that, that disposes of the second point of impression. Let me move to the third alleged false impression was his view uh, expressed at paragraph 150 in the judgment that granting immunity from actions in REM against a, a state cargo shipped on a merchant vessel would be difficult to reconcile with the restrictive theory of state immunity. And the Republic's contention is that its approach to the interpretation of section 10.4a is entirely consistent with the restrictive theory of state immunity. If we go to the skeleton argument at paragraph 60, we can see why the Republic says the material to which it refers is relevant. And I quote, The judge erred in failing to have regard to evidence of state practice, like it's comprising national, national legislation, case law, the 2004 convention, and the travail preparatoire, preparatoire to the convention. Close bracket. This clearly indicates the Republic's construction of Section 10.4a is consistent with the general approach of state practice, and the judge's approach is contrary to that practice. Well, our primary position on this material is that we just don't understand how this material is helpful or relevant. Fundamentally, what this court is charged with doing is interpreting Section 10.4a. A limited range of materials are relevant that task. Foreign state practice is not amongst them, uh, and the Republic has cited no authority to say that it is, uh, and that, with respect, is an end to what is effectively ground for uh, of the notice of appeal. N now, were these materials to be considered reflective of customary international law, the position would be different. 
in that case, they would be relevant to the interpretation. Uh, but the Republic itself carefully stops short in its skeleton of claiming this material reflects custom. And even if it did not, we've set out in our skeleton argument the various weighty reasons why it cannot reflect custom. And I don't propose to take the court to that. Our argument is set out by reference to authority, and I haven't heard anything that displaces it. The, the, the real reason why the Republic thinks this material is relevant uh, is set out in paragraph 33.5 of its skeleton. The RSA's, the Republic's approach, is entirely consistent with the restrictive theory, is illustrated by the limited case law of other states on the subject. Uh, and Mr. Smith confirmed this in oral submissions. So, so, so just to rephrase that, the Republic's position is that because a handful of other states, they identify only two, plus a passing comment by the ILC uh, in the RSA skeleton argument but not addressed in oral submissions, adopt the position that the Republic argues now, its position must be consistent with the restrictive theory. Well, that argument is hopeless and amounts to the Republic asserting what it sets out to prove. It doesn't assist the court. Uh, states may have a different understanding of what restrictive in immunity entails. Uh, as the Republic has rightly conceded, it's for each state to draw the line. And the methodology of how to draw the line in this jurisdiction is provided by the speech of Lord Wilberforce in, 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 in Premier Congresso, affirmed by Lord Sumption in Ben Carl Bush, and the Court of Appeal in Prestige Numbers 3 and 4. Uh, unless these authorities have set out to apply that methodology, which they obviously haven't, uh, totally I irrelevant. Uh, I, I, um, look, for, for those reasons, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to address the legislation um, one by one, nor am I going to address the two cases that, that are relied upon in our submission. They are entirely uh, irrelevant. Can I move um, forward then um, to um, 2017? <coughs> Moving forward in time, there is no obvious reason why the outcome should be any different in circumstances where the cargo has lain derelict on the ocean floor for 17. Relevant maritime circumstances took place in 1942, and nothing happened after the sinking to change the status of the ship. It was a ship first. It had not completed its voyage, and it was still a commercial ship, at least for the purposes of salvage. Further, the ship was at no time used for sovereign purposes, and for state immunity purposes, there is no <coughs> intermediate position. Uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Popper will ask a series of questions and made uh, certain comments in relation to the status of the ship uh, after the casualty. And let me seek to address those uh, as best I can uh, now. Uh, our answer is uh, that it is the cargo owner's use of the vessel which is key. And, uh, and that's our <laughs> We are here concerned with immunity. Um, so the act of a third party ship owner cannot determine whether the state has lost immunity. The, the fact that the Brussels Convention refers to merchant ships does not undermine that in our submission. In, in most cases, if the cargo owner is chartering or using a ship to carry goods, both the ship owner and the cargo owner would have the same use for the vessel, and both use parties' uses will be commercial. But not necessarily so. The Parliament of Belgium is an example of where that isn't the case. The cargo was put on board, but the predominant use was the, the Belgian government's use of packets, held therefore that the ship was uh, subject to entitled to immunity and was in sovereign use, even though uh, the 
car dealer it was in that case, were using it to carry commercial merchandise. Yes. Let me let me let me think that through. Let me think that through, and and while I'm thinking, I'll I'll carry on if I may. But I thought I heard little from it. I think perhaps the short, simple answer is is that. In our case, it doesn't matter, but that's not an answer to your Lordship's question, um, uh, and I see that. Um, yes, let me think about that. Um, well, the, the, my example, my next example, perhaps um, covers that. That's the only, in our submission, real, realistic situation we can think of where the use of the cargo owner and the use of the ship owner are not allowed. It is where a state cargo owner requisitions space on a ship, which is otherwise being used by the ship owner for trade. Well, that's that's the bottom and belt situation. Yes. In those circumstances, the state owner will be using the vessel for sovereign purposes because the act of requisitioning is sovereign. The ship owner, on the other hand, will be using the vessel primarily as a merchant ship. But in those circumstances, the state is immune from a claim in rem and in personam because its use of the vessel is sovereign. Yeah. That's what that's what went to the, to the conclusion that use of vessel is focusing on use by the ship owner, not use by the cargo owner. That's, isn't it? Well, I, I don't understand how that your last point helps you. I think what Mr. Hoffmeyer was saying was that the use by the cargo owner, in that, that case it's, a, it's the state which is the cargo owner, and the state is um, using the, the vessel for a sovereign purpose because it's requisitioning it. Correct. And therefore it's not using it for a commercial purpose, even though the owner of the ship, it's a merchant ship, maybe. Is that the point that you that, were making? That's the point I thought that's what I understood. Yeah. And in those circumstances, that is unfortunate for the solver, who's just sold cargo for a vessel that appears to be in use for trade. But unlike the present situation, there is a justification, a rationale for that conclusion, namely that there is a sovereign act, the requisitioning, at the heart of the maritime circumstance. Well, if you're focusing on the, on the position of the state, which is the owner of the cargo, Yes. Um, it was never engaged in trading in those circumstances. It had, re it had requisitioned the ship um, for its own sovereign purposes, and it wasn't actually engaged in commerciality. So it seems to me that your argument, irrespective of whose interest it is uh, or whose use in the vessel it is, um, must hold good or not, as the case may be, irrespective of whether the ship goes to the bottom of the ocean and somebody attempts to salvage it a day after it goes under or 65 years after it goes under. Um, because um, either that is a pertinent consideration that you somehow weave in to um, use of the cargo and or use of the ship at the dark time when the cause of action arises or you don't. And the time span, I quite take your point, the, the fact that 65 years have passed is neither here nor there. Either the status or the status quo or whatever changes, or you just look at the tail end of the cause of, of the ingredients of the cause of action at that point, uh, when the salvage is uh, due, or you don't. Yes. Isn't that right? I mean, it, 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 to, to me, speaking entirely for myself, it seems to me that the passage of 65 years is a red herring for the purposes of both sides' arguments. Because uh, Mr. Smith would say, well, it's no longer in use for anything. It can't be used for trading purposes at the bottom of the ocean by either party. Um, and therefore, you revert to the state um, owning the cargo, and it was always uh, that's a sovereign 
um, um, that's an element of sovereign use from which you have a carve out for trading purposes which can no longer be pursued. You say that leads to absurd results which don't chime with the restrictive theory. And the way that you uh, have round it is to have regard to maritime circumstances. I was going to ask you, um, I know this isn't quite the way that the judge put it, but in, in, by having regard to maritime circumstances, is that a sort of shorthand for saying, when you're looking at the time when the cause of action arose, you're looking at the time when all the ingredients of the cause of action arose and not the last of them? Two ways. That was certainly the submission I made yesterday. Yes. You've got to look at the totality, uh, because um, an ingredient in that is the position uh, at the time of the maritime circumstances, yes. which gave rise to the salvage. And I, I wasn't saying that that determines it in answer to my thing, but that, that informs it, unless there is some intervention by a wholly sovereign act subsequently. Which changes the maritime circumstances, because that's the ingredient mm. that one's looking at. C correct. Um, and which leads me to the example that... Um, Sorry, whilst, whilst you've been interrupted, no, I, no, no, I, I've been trying to formulate for my benefit as concisely as I can what, what, what your case is on the present tense of when the cause of action arises. and. As I understand it, uh, it, it proceeds that, first of all, in 4A, we're only or largely dealing with claims for salvage. And in claims for salvage, you can have salvage uh, from wreck. It's an ingredient of the cause of action that that salvage takes place in maritime circumstances. The maritime circumstances inevitably involve looking at the position before the salvage operations arose and looking at what gave rise to those maritime circumstances. Uh, th therefore, the ingredient of the cause of action which is relevant for the purposes of, of identifying what the use of the vessel or the use of the cargo was, and this is the only element of the cause of action to which use is relevant, is what use was being made of it, such as to, to make the circumstances maritime circumstances. Therefore, even though the inquiry has to be made after the salvage uh, has taken place and all the other ingredients of the cause of action has arisen, the ingredient to which the relevant inquiry goes uh, as to use of ship is necessarily a historical one as to how the ship and cargo came to be there before the salvage operations arose. That means that uh, the commercial or sovereign nature of the, of, of the activity which caused that uh, is going to determine uh, the, the, the immunity. And that will be determinative in almost every case, um, not necessarily in every case, because there may be a change in maritime circumstances. But uh, change in intentions for the, for, the, for, the, for the cargo, changes in intentions for the vessel, even changes in use of the vessel aren't going to affect the fact, if they, if they take place after the salvage has commenced, <coughs> that the relevant maritime circumstances uh, are, are those which, or the, the relevant use of the ship and the cargo uh, are... are that which gave rise to the maritime circumstances before the salvage began. Is that, I know that's a, uh, you may think, no, trod, trodden all over your submissions, but I, as, as, I, as I understand it, that, that, that essentially is, is, is what you say about the present tense of when the cause of action arises. Thank you. It is a question that you ask in 2017. Quite. But it is a, it is a question that includes all the aspects that my Lord has all the ingredients and the relevant ingredient <coughs> for the purposes of use is uh, were the maritime circumstances uh, correct because without them there could be no claim for salvage that's the crucial aspect that's the key correct. it's 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 exposing oneself to the need for salvage yes. 
and then when the salvage takes place during the voyage, immediately after a sinking which results in derelict, or 72 years later, it doesn't change the position. There is still the need for salvage, and, and that is established as long ago as this letters. I just wanted to be sure I, I really un understood your case. And, and you might claim aid uh, as an aid to construction, Article 3 of the Brussels Convention, which does distinguish, um, I mean, it's talking about ships in Article 3, 1. Yes. There is the phrase, and used at the time the cause of action arises, blah, blah, blah. But um, when you get down to Article uh, paragraph 3 of Article 3, yes. which, which refers to state-owned cargoes carried on merchant vessels for governmental and non-commercial purposes, there's no reference to the date when the cause of action accrued. Correct. So it's just talking broadly about um, the purpose for which they were carried on board the merchant vessel. I see right. someone nodding vigorously behind you. Y yes, <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm nodding vigorously in front as well. Um, and, and that explains... So it may be that the draftsman nodded in the drafting of Section 10 by carrying over the phrase at the time when the cause of action accrues or arises into both limbs when it actually it would accurately reflect Article 3 of the Brussels Convention um, if that phrase were only used once rather than twice. It's probably not a very clear question. It seems like the drafting of Article 10 has got too many use, one use too many of the phrase when the, at the time when the cause of action arises. Respectfully, I, I, I agree. And I appreciate that the argument may be that the restrictive theory has moved on since the point when the Brussels Convention was uh, ratified, yeah. but nevertheless, it's powerful evidence of a, of a bottom line of customary international law. Absolutely. And yeah. in our submission, if it has moved on... It can only have moved on in your favour. Exactly. become yeah. more restrictive rather than... Exactly, yeah. And whilst we've stopped you, can I just ask about intended use again, um, because you've been at pains to emphasise that the um, restrictive theory is focusing on activity, not purpose. But what the drafter appears to envisage uh, in 10 for A, or indeed B, is that even if the use <coughs> is sovereign, you can lose immunity if the intended use is commercial. So in that respect, uh, has, does the Act go further than customary international law and remove immunity where it would otherwise exist under customary international law? We say no, it does lose that consistent with the restrictive theory. Well, if, 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 if there's your, your nuclear weapon on a state ship, um, which you, I think, would say, well, that's sovereign use of both vessel and, and, and cargo. If it were the intention of the government to sell that weapon to the government of Ukraine at a profit, which would be a commercial use, it looks to me as though they would lose immunity by reference to in intended use of the cargo. And that, that does seem to me to go further than customary international law would suggest. I mean, it's not it's not a point against you necessarily no, because no, because domestically one is entitled <laughs> to, wi to 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 uh, withdraw immunity um, in circumstances where it would exist under customary international law. Um, unless, of course, you um, you don't get into that problem if um, use applies to a situation where there is a use. Um, there is a, a, a current use being deployed, an intended use is really designed to cover the situation where the voyage hasn't even started um, and the ship hasn't got out of port and there's a casualty. So you're looking that 
the intention was to, to use it for a maritime venture, but the maritime venture never got off the ground. I, I, I think the way in which I would approach it is to say that as a matter of public policy, the decision has been that um, I, I, if um, the cargo is intended for use for the purposes of a commercial transaction, because that's what one's going to put in there, for the purposes of a commercial transaction, uh, then th that is sufficient already to take it out of, of the uh, uh, um, scope of immunity on the proceedings. So if they, they, they're selling the nuclear uh, missile to Ukraine and it's being carried to Ukraine, they, they, they've entered into a, a domestic Ukrainian contract of sale. Well, to say they haven't yet, but that is their intention. That's what they, at the moment, they, it's not yet being carried to Ukraine. They've, they've got it in a state, state owned vessel coming somewhere in a different part of the world. But they intend, after this commercial venture is over, to sell it for a profit. Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think under the terms of the Act, you, they, they lose the immunity. Yeah. You're yeah. right. And all I was all, all I was putting to you, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's in any way undermines your argument, no, no, no. is that the drafter seems to have been removing immunity in circumstances where it might not have been removed under customary international law, because customary international law is not concerned with purpose. Yes. Well, I mean, I wanted to raise that because it was in my mind. But no, no, thank that, you. Uh, it, again, given the um, guidance of um, Gaida. <coughs> of course, the statute can be um, both widened or narrowed. Um, and so but I mean, we're not we're not bothered about that because no, if the immunity no. is being removed, I guess it's got nothing to do with the facts here. So it doesn't matter. Um, let me move on quickly in time. What available? The the Republic contends that the status of the cargo had altered between 1942 and 19 and 2017, and relies upon four matters. There, in the skeleton argument uh, at pages, uh, uh, paragraphs 54 to 55, 57.3 <coughs> and 59, uh, and I'm going to deal with each of those, 54 to 55, 54 to 55, 57.3 and 59. Dealing with each in turn. First, the cargo had been lifted the seabed. Well, it's not understood how the fact that the cargo was lifted from the seabed can have changed its status for the purposes of Section 10.4a. The act of lifting was the act of a third party, and it took place without the Republic uh, even being aware. The act did not change the use to which the cargo had been put by the state. Uh, the assertion is in any event absurd. The assertion is, in effect, that the act of salvage, which gives rise to the salvage liability, renders the state immune. Second, the Republic has had formed no settled intention as to what to do with the cargo. Uh, that the Republic had formed no settled intention as to what to do with the cargo was true of the whole period from 1942 to 2017. Uh, if the fact that it had not formed an intention is of any relevance, it, it supports the contention that there was no change to the status of the cargo. The Republic's inaction did not change the use to which the cargo had been put by the Republic. Third, uh, 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 third reason, uh, and this is paragraph 57.3, both the purchase contract and the contract of carriage had expired on the sinking. Uh, again, it's not understood how these facts, which are true of Ulrich, can have changed the status of the cargo for the purposes of section 10. Judge dealt with the argument in paragraphs 167 to 168. He, he did so convincingly in our submission. A and of course, the Republic's permission, submission would have the unpalatable consequences which the judge dealt with at paragraph 121 to 122. Then finally, the cargo lay dormant on the seabed for 75 years. Uh, if the fact that the cargo lay dormant on the seabed for 75 years is of any relevance, uh, it supports the contention that there was no change to 
the status quo. Uh, it is noteworthy that the Republic does not venture to suggest when during this period the status of the cargo changed or on what basis uh, it changed. When, when the salvors embarked upon their salvage operation, they were salvaging a commercial cargo which had been carried on a commercial ship. Nothing said or done or omitted to be done in the years since the sinking had changed the status <coughs> of either the cargo uh, or the ship. Uh, and the, the judge uh, deals with this case comprehensively at, at paragraphs 96, 150, 153, and his conclusion is at 163. Uh, and we would uh, encourage you uh, to uh, uphold his decision and his reasoning in that regard. I need to deal with the Section 13 case of Savas. Um, the Salvo's analysis is that in the use to which the ship and cargo are put by the it is the use to which the ship and cargo are put by the state that it is relevant. That provides further support for the judge's conclusion at sections one at paragraph 148 and 165 that the Section 13 cases, which concern enforcement jurisdiction, do not provide meaningful assistance in the different context of Section 10, which concerns adjudicative jurisdiction. Those cases concerned Section 13 and the property, the subject of the enforcement process. Those are cases in which the language of earmarking is apostate. Those cases did not concern the particular adjudicative jurisdiction for which provision is made in Section 10 and did not involve a ship and cargo and the cargo on board a ship. Section 10 for a specifically refers to a situation where both the cargo and the ship carrying it were in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. And so the, sec the wording of Section 10 for a requires in use to be given a meaning as it pertains to the cargo. The Republic's case is that the words in use effectively have no application. The passage from Savas, and that is authorities bundled. Well, I, I thought you were going to make the point that section 13 ties it to the, the, the what is happening for the time being, which doesn't doesn't depend on courses of action at all, and therefore doesn't look back to maritime circumstances. Correct. So that it's Section 13 is undoubtedly only forward-looking, present-looking or forward-looking. And it explains also why reliance on Section, or reference to Section 13 in the original application has disappeared because, of course, by the time the relevant facts came into consideration, the Republic of South Africa had entered into a contract with Odyssey uh, in relation to the um, salvage of, of the cargo. <coughs> but we won't go back uh, to dealing with that matter. Um, the passage in Savas, um, which is quoted in my learned friend's uh, skeleton army, that's divide 15, <coughs> needs to be read in context, uh, as always. <coughs> uh, and if we go to the judgment, uh, and um, the, 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 the relevant passage that's quoted by my learned friend is from page 335. Internal number. Uh, sorry, I do apologize. Six zero seven. Thank you. Tab fifteen, are we? Six zero seven. Which paragraph? Yeah. Sorry, just bear with me one moment. Paragraph 16 and 17, the top of the page. Uh, 
the expression uh, in use for commercial purposes should be given its ordinary and natural meaning, and, and then the all-important words in context, and, and we agree with that. Then skipping a sentence, uh, <coughs> as the Republic does in the quote, in the enforcement context, quote, Parliament did not intend a retrospective analysis of all the circumstances which gave, give rise to property, but an assessment of the use to which the state had chosen to put the property, close quote. This all makes sense, we agree. But it relates to property against which execution is being levied. The Republic then skipped down to just above D in their quotation. In the enforcement context, quote, it is not sufficient that property relates to or is connected with a commercial transaction. Again, this makes sense, uh, we agree. Uh, and then the words which the public do quote, uh, I would accept Mr. Howard's submission that this is consistent with the different treatment of the two categories of immunity in the Act. Uh, again, we agree. Section 13 is concerned with the court's enforcement jurisdiction. Section 10 is concerned with the court's adjudicative ju ju jurisdiction. And of course, Lord Clark makes that very point, doesn't he, at, at the beginning of paragraph 17. Co language correct. of section 13 is to be contrasted, contrasted with section 3 and section 10. In a passage that is omitted from the quotation, and my learned friend skipped on. Yeah. Uh, as regards the instant case, two points are made. Uh, for the purposes of section 10, the use to which the ship was being put and the use to which the cargo was being put were, as I've explained, the only relevant act to determine the use to which the Republic was putting the ship was trade, and if the analysis applies to the ship, so it too must apply to the cargo. Contracts of carriage and sale thereby determine the use to which the cargo is put. In the words of Mr. Smith, the use to which the state has chosen to put the property answers the question. Second point, the cargo did not merely relate to commercial transactions and activity identified in section 3.3. The cargo was not merely connected with commercial transactions and activity, it was in use for the purposes of the identified commercial transactions and activity. The cargo was itself in use for commercial purposes, for the purposes of those commercial transactions and activity. And that <coughs> takes one back to section 3.3 and the words that one has to read into section 10. Uh, and so clearly, uh, in our case, uh, the cargo and ship had been put to use for commercial purposes. Uh, in this case of Savas, the third party debt order was sought against a debt owed by uh, a bank to Iraq. The debt was not quote, in use or intended for use for commercial purposes, as had been certified. It was a sovereign asset. That the source of the asset, the debt, was commercial debts which Iraq had acquired by way of assignment from other creditors, did not affect the use to which Iraq was putting the debt. <coughs> that the debt could be said to be related to or connected with commercial debts, because the commercial debts were its source, was rightly found to be irrelevant. That, that's paragraph uh, 30 uh, in uh, the judgment. We agree, again, with the analysis. As Lord Clark said at paragraph 32, one must not align historical origins with current and f future use. Uh, or, or, as the first instance judge uh, in this case, in Savas had put it, Savas's argument wholly conflates the transactions by which Iraq acquired the debts that are the subject of the omitted claims with the intended use of the, those assets. A and there's a further point of distinction between section 13 and section 10. A at section 13, the use concerns property generally, whereas at section 10, the use must be given a meaning specifically in relation to a cargo and the ship on which it is carried. The Republic says that in use only applies to the ship and I've made my submissions 
in that regard. Drawing all the threads together, uh, we submit it is shown that a careful textual analysis of section 10.4a supports the judge's conclusion. The judge's conclusion gives the words of the statute a sensible meaning that is consistent with the restrictive theory of, of state immunity. Uh, just one or two final matters that I need to touch on. Uh, my learned friend took your lordship and your ladyships to the empire of Iran, um, or, or, or indeed was done on the previous occasion. Uh, you were taken to the first instance the decision of a judge in the German Federal Constitution Court, the Empire of Iran, uh, which, not being authority, was adopted by way of submission. Uh, and the judge accepted the proposition that customary international law adopts the restrictive theory of state immunity, <coughs> pursuant to which there is a dichotomy between acts of a sovereign character and acts of a non-sovereign character. No reference to acts of a commercial character dichotomy is sovereign, non-sovereign. The judge also accepted the proposition that the distinction between acts of a sovereign character and acts of a non-sovereign character is made by municipal law, since customary international law contains no criteria for the distinction. This is all uncontroversial. In England, the distinction was drawn and explained by the courts, as I've already shown by reference to Premier Congresso and Ben Carbouche. And the purpose of the State Immunity Act was to bring English law into line, we submit, with customary international law. And when construing it, it must be against that background. What the case does not do is to explain how the line is to be drawn under English law. Nor does it provide a methodology for analysing a particular claim. <coughs> it does not explain what acts must be addressed and how they are to be examined in the wider factual context. In England, the methodology is to be found in the speech of Lord Wilberforce uh, in Premier Congresso. Uh, that methodology has been explained most recently uh, in, by the Supreme Court in Holland in Lamp and Wolf. Uh, supplementary authorities bundle by, uh, two that divide to 23, uh, and, and most recently still by Sir Ross Cranston in the UK PNI Club in Venezuela. Supplementary authorities bundle two uh, at divide twenty eight. <coughs> the, 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 the real reason that my learned friend took you to the Empire of Iran, and, and indeed he admitted as much, was as an example of a judge looking at evidence about legislation in other jurisdictions. Mr. Smith used it as a way in to showing you such legislation. Well, I've already dealt with uh, why the legislation is irrelevant, uh, and uh, I'll move on. So, one comes to the final question. Uh, was the cargo in use for commercial purposes at the time when the cause of action arose? The issue concerns the status of the cargo when the cause of action arose. The judge used the date of the 2nd of October 2017 as the latest date on which it could be said the cause of action in salvage had accrued. Uh, he concluded that in cases of wreck, the character and status of the cargo upon sinking will usually identify the status of the cargo when the cause of action in salvage arose. A and his reasons are, are set out in, in paragraph 122, and I've taken you to those yesterday, a and we submit that that reasoning cannot be flawed. Uh, the Republic advances three arguments uh, in the alternative under ground three. Uh, first is that it was not appropriate to have regard to the status of the silver uh, in 1942, uh, and I've dealt with that uh, at length already. Alternatively, the judge attached undue weight to the silver's use or, or intended use uh, in 1942. A as regards this second point, the Republic's case has changed from its case set out in the grounds of appeal. Ground three was that the judge erred in attaching undue weight to the cargo's use or intended use uh, in 1942. Uh, it's no longer arguing that the judge gave undue weight to use or intended use 
in 1942. It's now arguing, additional scaling in paragraph 6.1, that the weight to be attached to the silver's actual use in 1942 should be minimal compared to the weight to be attached to its intended use in, in 1942. Well, I'm not sure I see the difference myself, but uh, we're not going to decide this case on movement of arguments at various stages. I, I, I may be right in saying that your submission that use of the vessel means use by the cargo owner is something that didn't emerge until your submissions today. Yes, I, I'm not criticising. I'm just pointing to what the argument is um, uh, now. But as regards this argument, the Republic has put forward, uh, not put forward any reason why the judge attached undue weight to the historic actual position, nor has it stated what proper weight would be. But also, but in, I mean, once it's conceded it's a relevant consideration, isn't, isn't the weight for the decision maker? Yes. Let, let me move to the third case I need to deal with. Um, alternatively, there was no reason to conclude that the character or status of silver had not changed. Well, that's the point that I've addressed a, a, a moment ago. Um, let me then conclude um, by um, uh, I I inviting um, your Lordship and your Ladyships to uh, go to the uh, list of issues uh, so that I can very quickly provide the answers uh, to each of those questions. Um, the uh, list of issues is in the um, supplementary, <coughs> the second supplementary bundle at, at divide nine. First question, uh, the answer is, we say that the receiver is obliged to detain the rig until any salvage due has been paid. Answer to 2.1. Two <coughs> is the owner obliged? The, the, the owner has the option of bringing an action for delivery up if he would like its cargo returned to it. Question 2.2. Two. Can the question issues only be determined in a claim for salvage? No, owing to the possibility of an action for delivery up uh, or um, an injunction being sought if the receiver threatens to deliver. Submission to the jurisdiction. We say the Republic would be deemed to have submitted to the jurisdiction of the English courts under section uh, 23A for the purposes of the action for delivery up. It said it would not necessarily require a determination of whether salvage was due and if so in what amount because the receiver is obliged to detain the wreck until salvage uh, is paid uh, but our submission is clear that they have submitted to the jurisdiction by uh, bringing the action <coughs> that is clear and they can't bring an action on limited grounds uh, in order to um, maintain uh, immunity. Or, does the receiver have statutory jurisdiction? Yes, uh, but that jurisdiction could be challenged either by way of judicial review of the receiver's decision uh, or other relevant court proceedings. For example, an action brought by the state against the soul. What are the powers and obligations of the receiver? The receiver must detain the wreck until the salvage is paid or until there is a final determination that no salvage is due or the owner is found to have abandoned ownership. Question six, state immunity. Uh, no, the receiver is not a court under section 21, 221 of the State Immunity Act uh, and so the Republic is not immune under Section 1.1 of the State Immunity Act from any determination by the receiver. So far as the 
Solvage Convention is concerned, Article 25, uh, the answer is also no, for two reasons. The Republic cannot prove that the silver is non-commercial cargo owned by the state and entitled at the time of the salvage operations to salvage immunity under generally recognised principles of international law. And secondly, in any event, the proceedings before the receiver are not judicial proceedings, as defined in the Merchant Shipping Act, Schedule 11, Part 2, Section 6. Was the silver cargo? Uh, yes, cargo that has become wreck is still cargo. Was it to carrying? On a true construction of Section 10 for A, it, it is not necessary for Talawa to be carrying the silver in the sense that the maritime circumstances giving rise to the salvage are ongoing, so long as the Talawa was carrying the silver when the casualty giving rise to the salvage services occurred. 9.1 is the fact that the Talawa was in use or intended for use in November 1942 relevant? Yes, in circumstances where no later act to change uh, <coughs> the cargo owner's use or intended use of the ship. In the light of the foregoing, was the Talawa in use or intended for use at the time of the cause of action rose? Yes, on the basis that, as said, the Republic as cargo under, un owner undertook no act and or made no decision that could change the use of Talawa uh, for its purposes from non-sovereign to sovereign. 10. One, it is the use uh, and or intended use of the silver in 1942 relevant to this determination? Yes, on the basis that the phrase must be understood in the light of the fact that the elements of the relevant cause of action accrued over time. This was my answer to my Lord. Beginning in 1942 <coughs> with the marine circumstances at the time of the casualty and ending in 2017 with the act of salvage and the conferral of a benefit to the Republic as owner of the silver. 10.2, was the silver in use? Yes, the silver was in use for commercial purposes. <coughs> and I've given now reasons for that in detail. Uh, was it in use for commer commercial purposes within the meaning of section 10.4a at the time of the cause of action? Yes, uh, on the basis that it was in use for non-sovereign purposes in 1942. Uh, and the cargo owner undertook no positive act between the sinking and 2017 that could change the use to sovereign. The, the act of abandonment uh, is not a, uh, it is itself a non-sovereign uh, uh, act if that is relevant. Uh, was the Silver 11 non-commercial within the meaning of Article 25? the salvage convention at the time of the salvage operations and is the status of the silver relevant to the determination of this issue? Uh, this issue is misplaced because properly construed section 25 is a savings provision that establishes that nothing in the salvage convention displaces an immunity arising at customary international law. Uh, beyond this the silver was not a non-commercial cargo in the meaning of Article 25 at the time of the salvage operations because it had never been a non-commercial cargo and between the time of the sinking and 2017 the cargo owner did nothing that could be considered to change its status. 12. Was the silver entitled to sovereign immunity? No. The Republic has not been able to point to a single sovereign act in the factual matrix from 1942 to the present day that could justify such uh, protection. Thirteen, yes, uh, granting immunity in such a situation would be completely inconsistent with the restrictive theory uh, and uh, nakedly disproportionate in the absence of some valid domestic policy justifying the from the restrictive theory, uh, and none has been uh, 
point of two, none exists. 14. <laughs> if so, is the court able to read? Uh, we, we set out um, uh, two ways here. Uh, we, we were asked. Um, uh, sorry, I've got two. So we've got. Not my lady, Lord, Lady Justice Lang asked for us to put that in writing. And That's very helpful. request. We've done our best we can over the short adjournment. Assumption is that, that our interpretation of the act is not correct, uh, and but that something has to be done to bring it into line with the restrictive theory. And the first way we do suggest it is it's not immune in respect as respects an action in rem against the cargo belonging to the state. If both the cargo and the ship carrying it were at the time when the cause of action arose not exclusively in use or intended for use for sovereign purposes. Uh, the alternative is simply to add where, where a cargo or ship that is not in use is deemed to be in use for commercial purposes, which is the uh, Australian uh, approach. Uh, and finally, to simply add with said use or intended use being informed by events preceding the arising what is, it? is there a distinction to be made between a cause of action arising and the completion of a cause of action? Um, because, because, I mean, the point you're making is that this particular cause of action has elements which come into being, might come into being years before the completion of the cause of action. The completion of the cause of action is when the salvage is actually done. Do I understand you? I was seeking to argue yesterday uh, that um, the cause of action arises, uh, when it arises, is a um, reference to um, um, all of the facts and matters uh, that go up to make the cause of action. Yeah. Uh, and um, I was making heavy weather against uh, enemy attack. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't put my case as, as high as that. But, but in our submission, uh, the, 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 there is. Um, well, you couldn't be sued for salvage, Mr. S uh, Hoffmeyer, until you rendered the services. And my lady's right. There are a number of ingredients of the cause of action. The last one is the rendition of the services. So, um, but that's when the cause of action is complete. Completion, Correct. yes. I mean, the language I think I used yes, it was, was that was that, that was when it was consummated. That's when it became. A, a, a cause of action which could be sued upon, yeah. uh, but but I gave the example I think of a, a tortious cause of action where you might have a, a duty arising in year one, you might have a breach arising in year ten, you might have damages arising in year uh, twenty. The cause of action for limitation purposes would arise only when the damage was suffered because that was an essential ingredient in in the cause of action. But in order to assess the cause of action one would be relying upon, uh, one would have to look at all of those facts as making up the cause of action. Well it's not just limitation it's, it's the, 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 the normal use of the word arises in relation to a cause of action is when all the ingredients are complete um, but, but you say that that doesn't mean that when you're looking at it at that stage for a, for a particular ingredient, in this case maritime circumstances, you don't have to look I think my answer was that, that, I, that if the court were to conclude that w when the cause of action arises requires one to look at the whole period, I wouldn't cavil with it. Um, I wasn't putting my case quite as high as that. I was putting my case in the way that your lordship has, has summarised. Um, if your lordship would just bring forward. Yes, 
was, I was, I'm reminded that I was asked to provide the, the Premier Congresso references to purpose not altering the character of the Act. Uh, and those are uh, 263 F to G, page 195 in the electronic copy, 267A to C, page 199 in the electronic copy, 268E to 269A at pages 200 to 201. Uh, uh, and unless I'm, I'm gone over, and I do apologise to my learned friends, I've gone over for five minutes and I apologise. Have we got an agreed list of the uh, sections in the 1894 Act? And the we have Act? one. It's not been handed up yet. We were hoping that we might get the agreement of the Receiver of Rec and the Secretary of State, but they have not been able to agree it yet, but it has been agreed between them. It won't be able to. No. no. Uh, but it is agreed between the appellants and the respondents. Let's, let's have that. Dr. Staker, it, it won't be agreed by you because it'll take you too long um, to get instructions. Is that what you're saying? Or basically, yes. I, I, but yeah, the, inter the interveners aren't disagreeing with it. I just haven't managed to get final instructions that it's agreed. But um, the right. comparison table of the legislative provisions are law. Well, well can we proceed on this basis? Uh, we'd like to reserve our judgments. Um, that you will let us know by, uh, let's say, close of play on Monday uh, if there's any, uh, you have anything to add or by way of agreement or disagreement. I'm obliged, my lord. <coughs> yes, yes. Um, my lord, my ladies, um, a, a quick roadmap, if I can, so we know where we're going. I'm going to start with the proper application of the restrictive theory. I'm going to go on to look at the proper construction of section 10. Time permitting, I'd like to make some brief submissions on some of the Merchant Shipping Act points, which I've discussed with my learned friend to, to try and avoid any overlap between what he's going to say, but he's going to do most of the work on those sections. But there are a few points um, I would like to make. Um, strictly speaking, of course, those first two issues, proper application of the restrictive theory and proper construction of Section 10, are the only ones that affect um, the outcome of the appeal, although obviously the other issues are all important. <laughs> So the restrictive theory. Uh, we accept that the restrictive theory um, applies, if I can put it that way, to start with, to in-rem proceedings uh, as well as in persona proceedings. So the point my learned friend was making yesterday it, it is in that respect common ground. But we need to unpack a little what we mean by that. And what we mean by that is that if a state claims immunity in response to an in-rem claim, the question of whether the claim to immunity succeeds is determined in accordance with the restrictive theory. It doesn't mean that necessarily exactly the same process of determination will take place as would be for an in, -perso an in personam claim. Uh, uh, and in one sense, um, that follows on from what Lord Diplock said in Alcom, um, which is um, bundle page 232, report page 600, letter G that in-rem claims are a hybrid. And so one would not expect exactly the same uh, processes to apply. And, and just to make good on that, the English Act, for example, um, the enforcement aspects of an in-rem action are dealt with in section 13, the adjudicative aspects in section 10.4. But also, in relation to cargo, the provisions in uh, section 10.4b in relation to claims in personam are different to those in, in relation to a claim in REM, because the claim in personam is purely adjudicative, whereas the claim in REM is, is still a hybrid. Um, the provisions, however, in relation to enforcement, uh, we would suggest, so um, section 30 now, um, are for cargo the same as the additional requirements for the adjudicative in REM proceedings over and above in personam. And what I mean by that is the point that my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell made, that if we compare 10.4a to 10.4b, we have a requirement that looks at the use of the cargo, as
as well as a requirement that looks at the use of the ship. And that reflects the fact that in the enforcement jurisdiction, if you're enforcing against the cargo, you would be looking at the use of the cargo. So it's that use of the cargo that is the key element that distinguishes between the in rem part of the hybrid proceeding um, and the in personam, and it is also relevant to the enforcement. Uh, we submit that the Act recognises that in relation to admiralty claims in general, if the ship is a merchant vessel, then the venture, or um, uh, circumstances, I think the phrase is, uh, has been used today more than venture, is essentially commercial. So that it is appropriate for the state owning the cargo to be susceptible to in personam jurisdiction. So this is the overall structure. But the Act also recognises that something more is required if the state is to be susceptible to in rem jurisdiction, which is based on the physical presence of the cargo in the jurisdiction that's being invoked. And that is that the cargo should be in use for a commercial purpose, just as if the cargo is being attached for enforcement purposes when it happened to be in this jurisdiction. Now I've started, even though I'm on the restrictive theory, not the Act, I've illustrated the point I'm making by reference to the Act. But if I can then move on to the restrictive theory as such, uh, 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 and uh, refer quickly to the Brussels Convention, um, Original Authorities Bundle, tab 50, um, page 972, because this has been described as the first international step away from the absolute theory, um, and it <coughs> too recognises that the claim in REM, uh, when considering a claim in REM against the cargo, it is necessary to look at the actual use of the cargo separately from the actual use of the ship. So we see in Article 3, uh, Paragraph 3, state-owned cargoes, so that's the only <coughs> gateway, carried on board merchant vessels, so the vessel is a merchant vessel, that's the commercial part of the overall adventure, for governmental and non-commercial purposes. So one is considering in relation to cargo, the government non-commercial purposes. Now, I, I, I take uh, my lady, uh, Lady Justice Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lang's uh, point that there is no reference in paragraph 3 of Article 3 to the time when the cause of action arises. But nonetheless, there has to be a carry of the cargo on board. Uh, and in our submission, for the reasons I gave yesterday, which I don't propose to go over again unless it would assist, the correct construction of Article 3, Paragraph 3, is that the first paragraph removes in rem jurisdiction or grants in rem immunity. The second simply permits in personam proceedings. And I don't propose to go over that again. It's a point of impression. I'm either right or wrong. But we would um, say um, that, that clearly, a, a, as uh, the court debated with my learned friend this morning, it would appear that the draft person of the 1978 Act shared our understanding of how Article 3, Paragraph 3 works. So being on board a merchant ship is not sufficient to lose immunity. Clearly one has to look at the use that the cargo owner is putting, the state cargo owner is putting <coughs> on the cargo to. Um, likewise, and I'll just give the reference, I don't think we need to turn it up, the UN Convention, which is Authorities Tab 24, page 618, uses the phrase in relation to cargo used or intended for use. So um, moving on on the application of the restrictive theory then, when we're looking at use or intended use. With respect um, to uh, Mr. Justice Robert Goff um, and the passage that was quoted from Premier Congresso yesterday, we would respectfully suggest that it's not sufficient simply to ask the question of whether the government is doing something which a private individual could do. If one is looking at a straightforward transaction, entering into a contract, committing a tort, writing a defamatory letter, or buying cement or boots for the army, as some of the examples one sees in the cases, then 
one can see the force that if one is doing something in the nature of something that a private individual does, that will be enough. But we would respectfully suggest that in the context of an in-rem claim and the need to look at the use or intended use of the cargo, it is necessary to delve a little bit further because the only relevant act is owning the cargo. Um, with very few exceptions, and another friend has picked the nuclear missile one, and I'll stick with that one. Um, most assets that could be owned by a state could equally well be owned by a private individual. So if for the in-use or intended for use purposes test, it was necessary only to look at whether the state was doing something a private individual could do, then virtually all cargoes would be non-sovereign for that purpose. Uh, and that, that, in our respectful submission, does not reflect um, the restrictive theory for the reasons that I will come on to develop. So mere ownership, um, my learned friend said, um, was not a sovereign act. We respectfully suggest that it is. Um, and the reason for that is that if the court is considering a jurisdiction which only arises because of ownership, so the in rem jurisdiction, one must look at the gov what the government is doing with the asset to see whether there's some nexus between the allegedly non-sovereign act and the cause of action. Um, I'll come back on that to, to, to look at um, the maritime venture uh, point that my learned friend has been stressing. So for immunity generally, one looks at the nature of the act giving rise to the cause of action. As I've said, entering into a contract, unfairly dismissing an employee, committing a tort. But for claims depending on ownership, one looks at use or intended use uh, and for that, we would start, or respectfully suggest the court would start, by looking at uh, Lord Diplock in the Alcom case. And again, I'll just give the reference. Uh, report page 604B to E, bundle page 236, where Lord Diplock referred to the necessity uh, to identify whether the um, property in question had been earmarked. Uh, and if I can just read it. Um, unless it can be shown by the judgment creditor, so this is, I accept, in an enforcement context, a point I'll come on to your due course, who is seeking to attach the credit balance. So first of all, important point, it's the person disputing uh, um, immunity who be bears the burden on this, uh, that the credit balance in the bank account was earmarked by the foreign state solely, save for de minimis exceptions, for being drawn upon to settle liabilities incurred in commercial transactions, as for example by issuing documentary credits and payment of the price, it, that's the judgment creditor, cannot, in my view, sensibly be bought within the crucial words of the exception that Section 13.4 applies to. So that's obviously in the context of Section 13.4, but nonetheless uh, so, uh, applies in, in, in our submission the restrictive theory. So we accept, um, coming on to the learned friend's <coughs> proposition 7, I think this was, uh, we accept that there is a dichotomy between sovereign and commercial act. The point in his Proposition 7 we do not accept is the suggestion that motive is irrelevant. In cases concerning ownership of property, the intent or purpose must be relevant. And that is not in our submission a presumption of sovereignty, but a recognition of the fact that property of a state must be sovereign unless the state decides to do something commercial with it. Uh, and that's for good reason. Uh, the property um, not specifically in use may be required at some stage for sovereign use. And if the court permits it to be impleaded in REM or by enforcement proceedings, that impairs the state's ability to make that decision. So um, there must, as I've said, be a nexus between the cause of action and the allegedly commercial act. And in the Philippine Admiral, that was a case where the claimants supplied goods, that's um, divider six of the authority bundle, supplied goods to the ships, Disbursements were made on behalf of the ship, and the claimants also claimed damages for breach of the charge part. The claims are all the direct consequence of the decision to trade the vessel. Trentex was concerned, that's tab 7 of the authorities bundle, uh, with contracts for the supply of cement to the government of Nigeria. But the claim was against the bank that had issued separate letters of credit and was for breach and repudiation of the obligations undertaken by the bank. The Court of Appeal concluded that the letters of credit were commercial contracts, so the claims for breach of them did not attract state immunity. Uh, to, uh, Lord, Lord Denning, at page 137 of the judgment, quoted uh, the United States Supreme Court, uh, and just if I can uh, echo that quotation, causes of action 
arose out of the foreign, the causes of action arose out of the foreign state's commercial action. And that's the touchstone of the test that the court should be applied. Lord Justice Shaw said at page 157, the restrictive theory took account of, quote, the nature of the transaction in respect of which the immunity arises. So one has to look at the nature of the transaction in respect of which the immunity arises. Uh, and then coming on to the, the case that Malone and Friend has looked at most, the Premier Congresso, tab 9. That, um, there were two claims, essentially, there. Although only one claim in REM against Premier Congresso, the underlying claims related to two different ships. And that's important, because the claim in relation to the player lager was for breach of contracts of carriage by non-delivery of the cargo, whereas Cuba was not, at the relevant time, the owner of the other vessel, Marble Island, when the bills of lading were issued. So the claim wasn't in contract. Uh, nor was Cuba the owner of the vessel when she broke arrest and sailed to North um, Vietnam. So there was no claim in contract against Cuba. We can see that clearly from internal page 191. Cuba's defences to the in rem claim giving rise um, to, to the application of sovereign immunity were that the um, breaches were sovereign in nature because they were driven by political considerations. And the holding, if one looks at the head notes, is that the restrictive theory allows individuals who have entered into commercial transactions with the sovereign to bring those transactions before the court. So the key cornerstone of the restrictive theory is that if the commercial the sovereign enters into commercial transactions, the co-party, the counterparty, is entitled to bring those transactions before the court. So there was no com immunity from a claim arising out of or connected with the commercial transaction. That's Lord Wilberforce at, at page 194D. In order to engage the restrictive theory, it's necessary to consider what is the relevant act that forms the basis of the claim, so the act by the sovereign. That's page 195C. Or what is the act upon which the claim is founded? That's page 199H. And whether the acts which give rise to an alleged cause of action were done in the context of a trading relationship. Um, in that case, that distinction was important, because although in the minority, Lord Wilberforce and Lord Edmund Davis would have allowed the appeal in relation to the Marble Islands because there was no nexus between the Sovereign Act and the breaches of contract relied on. Uh, and as Lord da Edmund Davis said at bundle page 299, report page 277, the question that arises is, is there, um, is, was there between those parties at any time a commercial relationship? Uh, and that analysis fits, M Malone Friend has referred to the prestige number three of tab 20, that analysis fits with the analysis of the Court of Appeal at pages 45, sorry, paragraphs 44 and 45, uh, where there's a quote from the Premier Congresso uh, where Lord Wilberforce concluded that it was not sufficient to look at the underlying transactions, but at the acts that constituted a breach of the underlying transactions. So there's a clear need for a nexus between <coughs> the cause of action and the trading relationship. I think the phrase that the Court of Appeal used in the prestige is that there was a necessary relationship between the breach giving rise to the cause of action and the trading activity. And um, by definition, we submit that one has to test this at the time when the cause of action arises, because one is looking at the relationship between the cause of action relied on by the claimant and that the alleged sovereign act of the defendant. And to answer my Lord's question, it's been repeated again today, in our submission, the cause of action arises when the salvage services have been provided and have had a useful result I ask the court to look briefly at the salvage convention. Um, we had it in, in the original authorities bundle. We have it in the supplemental, but I'll take it from the original authorities bundle, if I may. Um, it's tab two. Sorry. Tab three. Um, internal page. So bundle page um, 24. Rights of salvors. Article 12, conditions for reward, salvage operations which have had a useful result give rise to a right to the reward. So that is what the salvor has to establish to make good his cause of action. There are various other necessary requirements, uh, most of which can be seen in the definitions section in Article 1, uh, which defines Article 1A, salvage operations means any act or activity undertaken to assist a vessel or any other property in danger in navigable waters or in any other waters whatsoever. So uh, Malone is right that there's a, a, a subheading in Kennedy, which is Supplementary Authorities Bundle 
32, uh, page 629, or internal page 83 of Kennedy, referring to the maritime adventure. But it is important to note that the learned editors say at paragraph 3022 that though not formally recognised as an independent condition for a salvage award, there appears to be a de facto requirement for the activity to be undertaken um, by the salve or salve, that, that's the republic for these purposes, at the time of the casualty to be an activity of a common nature involving passage through maritime event waters. So this phrase, the maritime adventure or, or any other phrase that we're going to use, has, has with respect grown in importance and is now being asked to bear more weight than it can bear. The actual cause of action that my learned friend has to rely on is the provision by a salvor of services which confer a benefit on property which was in danger in navigable waters. So if one is going to take his broader analysis and look back at the history of the claim, those are the elements that one needs to come to look at. Right, so it was in danger in maritime waters at the time when it was torpedoed and it remained in danger when it got to the bottom of the seabed, so what? So, my, my lady, yes, but none of that um, affects um, the status of the cargo in terms of its use um, or intended use. I will come on to develop that. I thought it was important to, to pick that up at, at this stage. Um, and just to pick up on one other point, um, transcript from yesterday, pages 78 to 79, um, Lord Wilberforce did indeed say in the Premier Congresso that Port of Alexander had been wrongly decided. But that, with respect, was, that's tab 17, by the way, because she was a merchant ship earning freight. And that's why it had been wrongly decided, not for any other reason. Um, so, in the Port of Alexander, the useful result provided by the Salvor was that the commercial owner and operator of the ship was able to carry on earning freight. In our case, the useful result simply restores to the Republic an asset which had been intended for use for sovereign purposes. I'm just going to pause there because that is important. My learned friend has said several times today that there's no indication of anything commercial go uh, a sovereign going on with the cargo. Um, that, with respect, is not correct. He hasn't challenged the point I made in opening, that, uh, which is this, that on the basis of the learned judge's finding um, that um, the greater part of the silver was intended for use in uh, producing union coins and on a proper application of the test in Parliament Belge, that intended use is a sovereign use. So we have essentially, on the basis of the learned judge's findings of fact, an established sovereign intention the use of this cargo. And that's an important point that we invite the court to bear in mind. So um, that asset was, in our submission, abandoned um, in 1942. And after it had been abandoned, it was simply an asset of the state for which we formed no new intention until, again, on the learned judge's findings, after the, the cause of action had accrued on any basis. So uh, with respect to my lady, Lady Justice Andrews yesterday saying that it was a commercial venture from beginning to end, even if there was a commercial element in 1942, we would respectfully suggest that it came to an end in 1942 when the voyage was abandoned. And in one sense, Malone Friend accepts that because his paradigm example of something that should be immune is the nuclear missile. But if one analyzes the example, you're still looking at the purpose that the government had for the missile. There was a sovereign purpose. You still have to look at the purpose that the government has for the missile. And if that's good for a nuclear missile, why is that not good, for example, for all armaments? For example, rifles or small arms. Uh, and if it's good for small arms and rifles, they can undoubtedly be owned by a private citizen. And that brings me back to where I started. But simply saying, has the government owned something that a private citizen could own is oversimplifying the matter. Equally, when my learned friend says that exposing your asset for risk of requiring commercial salvage is sufficient, that cannot, in our respectful submission, be the correct test. Because if that were, putting the nuclear missile on a ship exposes it to the potential need for commercial salvage just as any other cargo. So simply setting sail on a voyage cannot be enough even on my learned friend's own case. Because even the most sovereign of sovereign assets, if I can put it that way, even on a state-owned ship, would still be exposed to the potential need for salvage services. So that cannot, in our respectful submission, uh, be the correct test. So we say there is a requirement for the state to be engaged in a, a commercial activity. 
um, and, and shipping on a merchant, venture, uh, a merchant vessel would be enough if one were looking at the cause of action arriving when the cargo was still on the merchant vessel as such. And that removes in, pers uh, in personam immunity. But the added requirement for the cargo to be commercial um, is required before you remove in rem immunity. And that's because permitting a claim in rem, we would suggest, directly impedes the state. And our authority for that is the Parliament Belge Authority Bundle 1, Tab 4, page 217 to 219, paragraphs 53 to 55. Sorry, bundle pages 53 to 55. And all of that is consistent in, in our submission with the provisions of Section 10.3 of the State Immunity Act, which I don't think we've looked at. I, I think I may have mentioned them briefly in opening. They're the sections that deal with um, sister ship arrests. So where um, the cause of action arises in relation to one ship, but the claimant seeks to arrest a different ship. And in relation to sister ship arrests, section 10.3 specifically provides that the commercial use must exist in relation to both the guilty ship, the ship in relation to which the uh, cause of action arises, and the ship to be arrested. Or, sorry, and the ship the subject of the in rem application. So not yet arrested, just the found jurisdiction. So there's a two-fold requirement for commercial use or intended use. And that reinforces the point I was making, that when you are looking at in rem um, jurisdiction, you need to look both at what gives rise to the cause of action and the status um, at the time the in rem proceedings are brought. So applying all this um, to the facts of this case, um, the cause of action is for salvage. And Malone and Friends said several times commercial salvage, but it wasn't commercial salvage. It was not carried out pursuant to a contract. It was speculative salvage. If there had been a contract, we would be within Section 3. My learned friend's analysis is that a, a maritime venture is required, and that he can say that because his cause of action generally relates to or requires the elements of the maritime venture, somehow one can look back to uh, 1942. But we would uh, respectfully show that the correct analysis is that his cause of action only requires him to show, uh, as I've said, useful assistance provided to property in danger. And that's why his silver stored under the water example yesterday doesn't exist. Well, not any property in danger. My Lord. Not useful assistance provided to any property in danger. If that's all you needed, that wouldn't be enough, would it? In, in, in a maritime context, uh, under Article 1. I'm sorry, I, I short circuited that. Uh, my Lord, quite that's, right. the critical, <laughs> that's, that's what he says is the critical element. Yeah. Um, and, 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 my Lord, to come back to a point that I. I I can't remember which member of the court raised yesterday uh, as to what the, the danger would be where the, the cargo is just sitting on the bottom. The cargo being unavailable to its owner is recognised in, in salvage uh, as being in danger. It's not capable of being used by the owner. But that's why his silver stored under the water example didn't work yesterday. Um, and the reason it doesn't work is because it, it, it's not in danger while it's being stored where it was supposed to be stored. But it's, that's, that's the only reason that salvage wouldn't if it was being stored, I don't know, in, in some metal crate that had been anchored at the bottom of the ocean and the anchorage broke free, um, or, or there was a risk of it drifting off, I suppose silver would be unlikely to drift off. But if a danger developed, then it could be the subject of salvage. Uh, and in um, 2017, we submit that there was no link whatsoever between any act uh, of the Republic, my client, and the salvage operation other than ownership of the cargo which was on the seabed, and we accept in, in that context was in danger. But in all other respects, that cargo was an entirely sovereign cargo. Um, see, in, in that respect, um, the Canadian Conqueror case, which is referred to in the Philippine Admiral um, at um, pages 105 and 108 of the bundle. That was a case where Cuba had purchased a number of ships, um, entered into a, a, an, a, 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 an agreement in relation to them for them to be traded by a third party, which had then been terminated. Cuba had essentially taken back possession. And after that, the ships had just sat at anchor, doing nothing. Um, but the court in the Canadian Conqueror, as referred to by the uh, Privy Council in the Philippine Admiral, concluded that the ships were entitled to immunity because they could at any stage be the subject of any decision by Cuba to trade them. So a non-trading vessel, uh, sorry, to use them for commercial purposes. So a vessel doing nothing was sovereign property for those purposes, so it's not to be susceptible to the in-rem jurisdiction. And that's a direct equivalent of the silver not being in use 
in 2017. Uh, uh, we would respectfully suggest that the basis of the judge's judgment is that in 2017 there was no actual use of the cargo of the silver. That's why one had to look back to 1942. And he also held that we hadn't formed any intention as to its use. Again, why he had to look back to 1942. And insofar as 1942 is concerned, we had an express intention to use the silver, which was based on the judge's finding um, uh, of, uh, and proper application of the Parliament of Belge sovereign. And for all those reasons, we submit that we must be immune to the claim in REM. The silver was never earmarked for commercial purposes. And insofar as one needs to look at the ship as well, we were using her, and I, to this extent I agree with my learned friend's analysis, for this purpose you need to look at the use we were putting her to in 1942. She was a merchant ship carrying the cargo then, but that use ceased in 1942 when we abandoned the silver at or about the same time as the owners abandoned the ship. So sorry, is, is your submission now that use of the vessel means use of the vessel by the cargo owner in section 1048, or use of the vessel by the ship owner? Um, it, for these purposes, we, we having heard the submissions and the debate between my learned friend and my lady, lady Justice Andrews, we would agree that use by the cargo owner is the one you have to look at for the purposes of section 10, 4A and B. And as my lady, uh, as my lady said um, yesterday, um, uh, um, the court will immediately appreciate for my client's purposes, one of the benefits of that is then that looking at the use of the ship for the purpose of granting immunity does not become disproportionate because you're looking at the purpose of the ship and the purpose of the cargo. And that's why I said to my lord earlier um, that um, one had to look separately under 10.4b, just at use of the ship, and under 10.4a, use of the ship and use of the cargo. Um, but and how do you square that with the use of the expression merchant ship? Because if we are using her for commercial purposes, she's a merchant ship. If not necessarily, not, Parliament Belge. My, my Lord, I was go going to come on um, um, to deal with that, and I I'll, I'll pick that up now if I can. Can I posit a slightly different example to, to the one that was put to my learned friend to show why in our submission this, this does work? If you have a state-owned ship owned by State A um, with a state-owned cargo owned by State B, on the ship. The ship is used for predominantly sovereign purposes, as in the Parliament Belge, and is therefore immune. But State B is paying for the carriage of its bit of cargo on board. When one can, uh, and that's de minimis enough to mean it doesn't affect the commercial character of the ship if one were bringing a claim in rem against the ship. But if one is bringing a claim in REM against the cargo... It's enough. Uh, I'm sorry, it's my lady. enough. It's enough. I exactly. My lady sees the point. So you then look at the use of the ship by the cargo owner is commercial because they're paying for their cargo to be carried on the ship and the use of the cargo. Uh, uh, and that squares the circle, we would respectfully suggest, rather neatly. So th that... Well, is that if they put their cargo on a merchant ship, their use is uh, commercial... In, indeed, so they would also not be immune in those circumstances. Yeah. I, if that use was ongoing at the time the cause of action arises, which would agree I have to come on to deal with. Yeah. So, um, in 1942, on that analysis, I accept that if salvage services had been provided, the Republic or the Union government would not, or would probably not, have been immune to a claim in persona, because you would look at its use of the ship through the perspective of, of the owner, uh, the cargo owner. But of course, um, that in one sense is for another day if we end up in court on the Union Persona and Claims Court. But what we did in December 1942 um, was to abandon the cargo. Uh, we treated the cargo as being lost. And in terms of the debate my, my Lord had with my learned friend about what, act, what, what was the act of abandonment, um, we would agree that it can be inferred, as my learned friend said, but just to pick up a couple of bundle references, in the original supplemental bundle, page 252 and 253, are telegrams referring to the cargo as being lost or having been lost by enemy action. And we would suggest that they reflect an understanding by the Republic that the cargo is lost to it, and therefore they abandon it. And so on, on that basis,
basis, the correct analysis we would respectfully suggest is that any historic or antecedent activity um, of, of a commercial nature came to an end because the relevant commercial contracts um, were, whether one says they're frustrated or abandoned, um, in fact, we perform sale contract and our obligations under the carriage contract because we paid the freight and, and the purchase price in, in December 1942. I say we, the union. And so, insofar as those form part of the, the, the history, the original maritime venture, just to put it at its highest, they are, with respect, history. Um, the cargo is in danger in 2017, it's only in danger because it is still um, on the seabed. Uh, but it is not on the seabed pursuant to, or in accordance with, or as part of, the maritime venture that had been ongoing in 1942. How, how does your position that use of the vessel uh, is used by the cargo owner sit with your submission that Section 10 can't apply to wreck? Because in relation to wreck of the vessel, it's undoubtedly the intention of the ship owner one has to look at. Isn't it? Uh, my Lord, I accept that. I mean, in that sense, uh, our submission that it doesn't apply, Section 10 4 a <coughs> doesn't apply to wreck, it is principally that it's looking at the property. I'll just use the property neutrally. So it applies to wreck, rather, sorry, it applies to cargo rather than wreck. So it's, it's the cargo that we say. I'm, very yeah, I'm going to come on to the construction of 10.4, so if we right. perhaps turn right. up to the State Immunity Act, and essentially what we say, 10.4a, an action in rem against any cargo belonging to the state, it's that word, the use of the word cargo there, rather than wreck, that we focus on when we say the section doesn't apply in the case of a wreck. So although we also say the ship was a wreck by then, um, and we pray that in aid as well. The key aspect that if we're right on the wreck cargo issue, the key, as the key consequence of that is that 10.4a doesn't apply because it only applies in relation to cargo, and the cargo that has become wrecked is not cargo. So it can apply to a wrecked vessel, cargo, cargo on a wrecked vessel, non wrecked cargo from a wrecked vessel. If the circumstances of the wrecking of the vessel, of, of the vessel becoming wrecked, didn't lead to the inference that the cargo was as well. So they didn't go hand in hand as in the Lusitania. I'm struggling to, to postulate a fact where you might have the cargo had become wrecked, but the ship had not also become wrecked. Because the cargo you can think of an alternative, can't you, which is Mr. Justice Tears' um, vessel running aground on the sand, sandbank and becoming constructive total loss, but there's nothing wrong with the cargo. Well, what about the throwing the cargo overboard? Um, well, we're into, yes. That, that would depend. That may be different because it, because the fact of wreck doesn't depend upon anybody's intention. I, I was going to say, that. that would be different because the fact of wreck didn't depend on um, abandonment and therefore necessarily enable one to say that there was no the second string of my bow when I said there were three strings didn't necessarily enable one to say that there was no longer carrying on board. Uh, but I mean in one sense that string would then become even stronger because the cargo has been thrown overboard. So there's certainly no carriage going on after that. Um, my Lord, I, I apologise for rushing but I'm conscious that I've got to leave time for my learned friend so if I can continue on to section 10.4. Um, we submit that the words used need to be given their ordinary and natural meaning and that the judge failed to do so. E even if we're wrong um, on the cargo wreck point, one needs to look at the scope of section 10.4. Uh, it, it is, subject to one point, materially the same as section 13, um, insofar as it refers to the use or intended use for commercial purposes. The difference is that section 10 refers to at the time the cause of action arises whereas Section 13 refers to from time to time. But in our respectful submission, that merely reflects the fact that Section 10 is about an adjudicative jurisdiction, so you're looking at when the cause of action arises. Section 13 is concerned with when you are trying to enforce. You don't need a cause of action to enforce. You've already got your judgment. And so in our respectful submission, that is the only material difference between the two sections.
protection, the words used by the draftsman are identical to use or intended use, and one has to therefore look in our submission. Um, obviously, in context, but at um, the authorities in, in relation to enforcement, not least because there are no authorities in relation to the exercise of the adjudicative uh, jurisdiction. Um, and therefore, uh, as I said in opening, and I, I'm not going to repeat it, but if I can just pick up the references, we do invite the court particularly to look at what Lord Clark said in Savas. And he quotes um, Judge Garza, again from the United States case at um, page 338, that what matters is what the property is used for, not how it is generated or produced. And in the context of a bank account, what matters, uh, again in the American case, was not how the Congo made its money, but how it spends it. Uh, and it was also said that property is used for a commercial activity when it is to put into action, put into service, availed or employed. Now, my client's cargo, or the, the union's cargo, was never put into action, put into service, availed or employed for the purpose of the sale contract or for the purpose of the contract of carriage. It was the subject of those contracts. They were made for the benefit of the cargo in order to enable it to be bought. And we accept that those are commercial transactions and subject to the fact that they were made with another state and that has different sovereign immunity issues, subject to the fact they were made with the state of India, um, we, we would not be immune in respect of being sued on those contracts. But that is wholly different from whether we are immune in respect of salvage services later provided voluntarily by the loan offence client. And we submit that on the ordinary meaning of the words, use or intended for use, the cargo was never in use. It was intended for use for sovereign purposes in 1942, but never in use. The, 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 the vessel in this case was in use in 1942 and the new uh, uh, approach because the government of South Africa <coughs> was using the vessel for commercial purposes. And what, 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 what did it do to use the vessel for commercial purposes? Place um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was at the end of the was boring because um, I was just stopping to think who placed the cargo on board, but arranged for its cargo to be carried on, on the ship. Well, if that's use of the vessel, why, it, why isn't that use of the cargo as well? Um, be because the vessel is being used for the cargo, not the cargo used for the vessel. But both are being used for the purposes of fulfilling a commercial contract. And it's the same contract. I, I'm not going to push a closed, closed door, my lady. Well, I it's, it's, not a, it's not a closed door, um, <laughs> Mr Smith. I'm just trying to struggle with, with why you have the... If you concede the use of the vessel, you don't inevitably concede the use of the cargo. Um, be, because... I, I can't do anything more than perhaps go back to what the judge said, that it's not really in the ordinary understanding of the word in use, that no, a cargo is in use while it's being carried. Yeah. The, ca the cargo is receiving the benefit of a service from the ship. That's why I concede that we're, getting, we're using the ship to confer a benefit on the cargo, but the cargo isn't being used for the purpose of that. It's getting the benefit of that contract. But, but even if I'm wrong on, on, on all of that, my lady, the more one pushes that analysis, the more one is forced to say that if the commercial activity is that contract, it had come to an end with the abandonment in 1942. Um, so if, contrary to our case, the cargo was in use in 1942 because of its involvement in facilitating trade, <coughs> I think was one of the phrases that was used, or of making the trade commercial transactions possible, that use came to an end in 1942. It certainly was no longer facilitating that, that, that um, trade or commercial transaction. And my learned friend, um, he, he um, accepted uh, on a number of occasions I think today that use could change from time to time. And with respect, if, if the use that a sovereign puts its asset to can change, his inner choice point really falls away because the availability or otherwise of immunity will always change in a price when the decision to change the use of the asset is made. Is your position that the, when the contract, the merchant venture came to an end, the cargo was not being put to any use at all? Or is it that you were putting it to some sovereign use? Um, both, my lady, because our well, position is... What was is, the sovereign use? Our position is that if a state owns an asset which it has not earmarked or put into a commercial use, it is simply an asset of the state, and that is sovereign use, owning an asset for the benefit of the state, which it can at any time 
devote to a sovereign use if it chooses to, or in the exercise of its sovereign function, um, it, it earmarked for commercial transaction if it chose to. But whilst it is simply an asset owned by a state that has not yet been earmarked either way, it is a sovereign asset. And any conclusion to the contrary interferes with the state's right as a state to make decisions in the future about its use. And so it is in use as a sovereign asset. So that, that, that's the little quibble we have about the use of the word where there's a third category. There's use, there's intended use. In one sense, there is a third category, not in use, but in our submission, not in use, um, uh, it, it is sovereign in this context. And, and just to conclude um, on this, our construction, um, the final point, in use or intended for use, whether our construction of looking at intended use renders the words in use OTO, in our respectful submission, it doesn't. If one looks at 10.4a, um, what one sees is uh, the ship, cargo and the ship carrying it, were both, at the time when the course of action arose, in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. And all that wording does is allow the various possibilities, ship and cargo in use, ship and cargo, neither of them in use, but both intended for use, one in use and the other intended for use, or the other way around. So if we say focus on the intended use of the cargo, that doesn't make the words in use in the section OTOs. It simply means that a package of wording has been used in use or intended for use to apply to both the ship and the cargo. So um, I, I'm sorry for doing that a rush. I am going to skip over my points about um, the receiver rec. My learned friend is aware of them, and I hope he will make them for me. Um, the only other point I wanted to make, which is not one of my learned friends, is whether we can play an aid state immunity to obtain the cargo without paying salvage. Just to make the point that um, obviously my learned friend has said that my Article 25 point doesn't work because I can't get home on the fact that the cargo um, is entitled to immunity under ordinary principles of international law. Subject to that, though, he's only made one point in, in opposition to the points I made about Article 25, which it doesn't apply to a determination by the receiver of REC. Um, and, and I do just need to meet that, uh, and I'll meet it as follows. If the end game if I can put it this way, of the waiting game that on my learned friend's case uh, eventuates is that we make an application for delivery up. There are then court proceedings. And in those court proceedings, the court will look at Article 25, and Article 25 does say you can't rely on Article 12 to justify the detention. So Article 25 will actually be applicant to the court proceedings because you, by, by the very fact that you're starting the action in England, you must be submitting to the jurisdiction. Uh, uh, my lady, uh, grateful to my lady for raising that because I meant to mention it in, um, and the reason why the answer is no is this um, if we were looking at state immunity in relation to the action that is our action for delivery up then yes there's a waiver and ten, uh, 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 um, and, and uh, there's a submission and potentially that submission is wide enough to encompass counterclaims arising out of the same facts but crucially article 25 is engaged by reference to whether the cargo was entitled to immunity at the time the cause of action, that's the cause of action for salvage arises. And so I would still be able to say, applying Article 25, there is no immunity, sorry, there is no entitlement to look to Article 12, even if by commencing an action in court I, I had waived. So I'm grateful for, for raising that, my lady. And then, but alternatively, the end game were that Argentum bought its action and said, please don't deliver up the cargo exactly the same reply would be into court. Undoubtedly, Article 25 uh, would be engaged, provided I've got home on any of the facts. So just in conclusion, if I may, um, in asserting immunity, uh, we, we still um, suggest that we are not seeking to shirk an obligation to pay salvage simply by maintaining immunity. We're suggesting that the issues relating to salvage need to be dealt with in an appropriate court. We accept, and I said this at uh, day one, transcript page 32, that we would be susceptible to an impersonal claim in South Africa. And uh, my learned friend may say, well, there's, there's no evidence of any of this, but it is a matter of record, and I hope he doesn't dispute this. One only has to look at the IMO website of, of the conventions that have been um, enacted that South Africa is a party to the salvage convention. But even if we were refusing unconscionably or in bad faith to pay salvage, that isn't um, an issue for this court. Um, the whole purpose of the doctrine of state immunity is to prevent issues being canvassed in the courts of one state as um, as to the acts of another, that's Lord Wilberforce and Mr. Kinnear can the rest of us. 
We accept that on our case, a state owner of cargo is always immune in personam and in historic wreck cases. I don't shirk from that as being the conclusion of our case. But is that really a bad thing? It's for Argentum in this case, well, it is for Argentum in this case because they haven't bought their claim in South Africa in time, we say. But they knew that we were claiming ownership and immunity well before the limitation period expired when the court gets the, the clip of cross 1 and 2C. That, um, about nine months before the limitation period expired, they were aware that we were asserting an immunity under Article 25. They had plenty of time to bring the right action. So if, if uh, th there's any hardship in this case, it's not because we are claiming immunity. And if there is immunity, that encourages Salvors to take the wreck to the state that it belongs to. And if they don't know which state it belongs to, at least encourage them to seek to find out and in due course sue in that state rather than here. And that's the answer to my learned friend's merits point about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I apologise for speaking to Dr. Stacey on that merits point. Oh, and I should say, um, it was helpful to hear my learned friend's answer to the issues. As the court, I hope, will recall, we set out our answer to the issues in an appendix to our supplementary challenge and argument to Stacey's argument. I'm very grateful. Uh, may it please the court, I propose to make a brief submission in reply in relation to the issues in which, uh, in respect of which the interveners intervene. Then um, I propose to address seven questions which arose uh, in the course of my submissions on Tuesday um, to uh, inform the court of the extent to which I can answer them. Um, the submission in reply addresses two matters. Um, first, the proposition or the suggestion that Section 239 of the Merchant Shipping Act treats ownership and salvage in the same way. My submission is that it does not. Um, the second matter is the concern that salvage due, um, that it would be problematic if it had a different meaning at the point of detention to what it had at the point of release. And in my submission, um, that expression salvage due can be defined in a way that it has the same meaning at both points in time. In relation to those, the first of those matters, um, if I could just ask you to look at the text of section 239 itself, um, which is on... Um, page 78 of the additional authorities bundle. We see that what it says in relation to ownership is, um, is if an owner establishes his claim to the wreck to the satisfaction of the receiver. So it refers expressly to the owner having to satisfy the receiver of something. In relation to salvage, it just says on paying the salvage due. Now, if it was treating both ownership and salvage in the same way, what it would say would be on satisfying the receiver of what the appropriate amount of the salvage would be, and furthermore, upon satisfying the receiver, that that amount of salvage has been paid. And this, in my submission, in fact, is yet a further example of how the Act, when it does confer a power or a duty on the receiver, it does so expressly. So it's been submitted ownership. It's, it's not binding. It's not legal. It doesn't prejudice the rights of anyone. It's simply the receiver, in order to determine how to exercise the power under this statutory provision to decide who to release the wreck to, there is an express statutory provision that the purported owner has to satisfy the receiver, and the receiver has to be so satisfied. There is no corresponding wording in relation to salvage, and that, yet again, in my submission, is a textual indication that the matter of salvage, or salvage awards, is not decided by the receiver. Um, in my submission, it's necessary to look at the provisions relating to detention uh, in terms of a scheme that is intended to be workable and practical and to achieve a useful effect. And it 
also has to be looked at from the point of view of the receiver of REC who has to administer it. How, how is this meant to work in practice? Um, and in my submission, the key provision is in fact section 227, which is on page 72, referred to it already in submission. But section 2272 refers to three cases. That a salvage award is not disputed, and the second two are effectively the same thing. A salvage award is decided by a court. And, and what that provision effectively does, together with the other provisions, is that if a salvage award is determined, either by agreement or through a court decision, then either the owner pays that amount and the wreck is released, pursuant to section 2262 and 2391, or the owner doesn't pay, and then the receiver sells the wreck, distributes the proceeds, and that way the salvage is paid. That is the purpose of the detention. In order that uh, a salvage award that is either agreed or determined by a court can be satisfied out of the proceeds of the detained property if it's not paid. Do you extend determined by a court to determined by an arbitration? Yes. Tribunal? Yes. I would say an arbitration is either by agreement if the parties agree to submit to arbitration, uh, or it's it's by a decision of the court if court proceedings are brought to challenge the arbitral award or to enforce it. So effectively, 227 says court proceedings, implicitly arbitration, or by um, agreement. Um, and in that sense, the meaning of salvage due it already emerged in previous submissions. It, it can't mean that the receiver has to have a court decision already before even detaining, because that would totally defeat the purpose of the detention. What it must mean is, salvage due must mean it is expected that the circumstances referred to in section 2272 will arise. It well, is expected. This is the provision that doesn't actually use the word due, does it? Uh, it doesn't but, use the word due. But, but what you what say that that's it, inherent in it, payment of salvage. It's got, it, it, it must mean payment of salvage. Well, due. well the, the due, or, although due is used in 2261 and 2391, the, the submission is it, it doesn't actually mean that. Be, be, or, or it certainly doesn't mean that it's been established that salvage is due. What it, what it means is it is expected that it will be established that salvage is due through one of the circumstances referred to in 227 subsection 2. Well, actually, due is used in 227 to 2A, where the amount is not disputed, the payment of amount due is not made within 21 days after the amount is due. So, so there's a recognition that... I mean, it's not used in B and C, but, but that must be implicit, you'd say. Um, yes, and, and what it means is that um, if the circumstances are so, if we're talking about REC, REC is declared to the receiver of REC under section 2391. So someone says, I found it. We don't know who the owner is. There's then provisions for finding the owner declared to the receiver of REC, it is held by or to the order of the receiver of REC, but it's also being detained under section 2261. Um, <coughs> and at, at that point, at that point, it would be apparent to the receiver, if it's declared by a salvor, the salvor would be indicating, I intend to claim salvage. So it would be apparent that the circumstances referred to in section 2272 are likely to arise. 
if the salvor said at a point of time when the owner hadn't even been identified, hadn't come forward, I don't intend to claim the land, then it would be apparent that the circumstances in section 2272 wouldn't arise. The wreck would still be held by or to the order of the receiver of wreck until an owner came forward. If no owner came forward, it would be dealt with as unclaimed wreck. But it would no longer require to be detained under section 2262. It would be held by or to the order of the receiver of wreck under 2391. But the submission is that salvage due under, at the point of detention means it is expected that the circumstances in section 2272 will arise. Will or might? Uh, I, I would say it is expected that they will. It is expected that either... Isn't that putting it too high? I mean, it, it, surely, um, once you're on notice that there is a claim, whether it's opposed or not, you can't make a judgment as to whether or not it will happen, because that will be for the court. Um, but if, if there is a claim for salvage, uh, which may be found to be due in due course by one of these various uh, methodologies, then you hold on to it under the section. Y yes, I, I perhaps didn't make that clear. Mm. Not, not, uh, when I say expected, I'm not talking about the expected outcome of any court proceeding. That, that, that was what I was quibbling Yes, with. no, no, no. Detention would certainly happen if a claim has been made. Um, if negotiations... Claim has been made which has not yet been resolved you say by the methodologies that are contemplated yes. by this section and there is no other methodology. Yes, yes. That, that, that's a submission. Um, and therefore salvage due at the point of release would have the same meaning. So that, that the wreck would be released once it's no longer expected that there will be any salvage award determined by one of the methods in section 227 subsection 2. And again, that might arise because the salvor says, I relinquish any claim for salvage. It could happen because the court says limitations periods have expired. It could happen because the court says the owner has state immunity. Well, why can it happen if the court says that the, that the, the owner has state immunity if it's still open to sue them somewhere else where they don't? Um, that's one of the questions that the court asked that I was going to come to in due course. I can give the answer to that immediately. It might, um, might assist thinking at this point. Um, I, I am instructed that if proceedings were brought outside the United Kingdom, and particularly if they were brought in a state party to the salvage convention, um, such that any decision of the court of that country could be enforced in the United Kingdom, that the receiver of REC would continue to detain property on that basis. Um, and so the, the issue for the receiver would still be whether it's expected that there would be an outcome pursuant to section 2272. We would then read court as including a court in a jurisdiction outside the United Kingdom. Um, the one thing um, I would add is that the position of the receiver of REC is that limitations periods under the United Kingdom legislation would apply. So there's a limitations period in the salvage convention, that is the limitations period that applies in the UK, but under the salvage convention it's open to, to um, contracting states to apply a longer period. There may be states that aren't parties to the salvage convention that have longer limitations periods still, and the submission is um, the receiver wouldn't continue to detain on the basis that theoretically it's possible that the salvor might bring a claim in country X where they have a 25-year limitation period. It, it would be a case that at the end of the limitation period in the UK... The limitation period in the UK only applies to proceedings in the UK and not elsewhere. So what is the juridical basis on which the receiver would take that decision? Um, at, at this point, um, I can say no more than that is the position of the receiver of REC. I would have to... It seems I, I, to be on the basis in, in, of it to be Yes. I, well, well I, I would say the court may or may not accept that position, but that, that
that's the position of the receiver of rec. But I mean, I can completely understand the idea that the receiver of rec would um, uh, not want to hold the property indefinitely. But if there is a working assumption that uh, it's still open to a party to sue in a place where there's jurisdiction, um, then um, I, I can't see the justification for releasing it simply because the English limitation period is gone. I thought you were going to say that because uh, the whole of this only applies to claims under this chapter, that is to say, uh, claims under the Convention, uh, the receiver is only ever concerned with the two year limitation period. Well, it's still like it's still of like the domestic law elsewhere applying something other than the salvage convention. Yes, but the salvage convention itself allows the state to apply a longer limitation period. Mm -hmm. So even in another state that's a party to the convention, there may be a longer. So, so hypothetically, say you have a state in which there is a longer limitation period, and the receiver is notified that proceedings have been brought, albeit after expiry of two years, but within the domestic limitation period. What, what would the receiver's attitude be to that, which you just want um, to know? Well, 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 again, I, I would have to say that I'd have to take instruction okay. on All that. Right. It's, uh, um, but I, I, I think the, the point is, first, that the receiver's position is, yes, detention would continue in aid of proceedings brought elsewhere, yeah. Yeah. But, but this has to be a practical a practical or workable scheme from the point of view of the receiver of REC who has to administer this and, and has to be clear as to what the duties of the receiver are in the situation and how this is to work. And it, it's, it's quite simple. If there is a limitations period that applies in the United Kingdom, at the end of that limitations period, the receiver can say, is there agreement between the parties now? No. Has anyone brought proceedings in the UK? Yes or no. If no, has anyone brought proceedings in any other country? Um, and that is relatively simple to administer. Um, so as I say, on, on that basis, um, the meaning is the same both at the point of uh, tension and at the point of release. <laughs> um, And it would also mean that uh, the, the question that the receiver is deciding when it comes to the question of salvage due in section 2391, the question wouldn't be what is the appropriate amount of the salvage award has it been paid, which is the suggestion that's been made before. It's simply are the circumstances in section 227 subsection 2 expected to arise? Um, if the limitations period hasn't yet run, it's still possible. Um, but at the end of a limitations period, if there's no agreement, if no court proceedings have been brought here or in another country, or if court proceedings have been brought and the, the, the uh, claim to an arbitration award has been rejected, or the court has said state immunity, limitations period, that's what's been said here, but no proceedings have been brought anywhere else. The receiver can say it's no longer expected we're going to have an outcome under section 227, subsection 2, um, and salvage would no longer be due in terms of either section 2261 or section 2391. Um, if I can just address then quickly the, um, the questions. Um, the first one, proceedings outside the UK, I've already addressed. We had the question about whether, whether the classification of something as a wreck depends on um, what the intention of the owner or the intention of the ship owner, the owner of the cargo, the intention of the ship owner. Again, if the scheme is to be practical and workable from the point of view of the receiver of wreck, it's not possible for the receiver to grapple with those issues at the point of detention. Um, if somebody declared something to the receiver of REC under Section 2391, the receiver would detain it. If an owner subsequently came along and said, by the way, I'm the owner and you can't detain that because it's not actually REC, then that question would be addressed at that point uh, and the time available. Um, I, I can neither get instructions nor elaborate on how it would be dealt with. Um, 
that it would be at that point. Um, the question was asked, um, can the receiver of REC decide the security in any sum at all, or only under £5,000? I'm told it is, in fact, the position of the receiver of REC that the receiver can determine security in any amount at all. Um, but uh, if, if either party disputes it, then it would go to the High Court. Um, the question was asked, what is the meaning of otherwise in section 247 of the 1894 Act? Uh, I'm told that one possible meaning of that would mean determined by the Board of Trade in the case of unclaimed rec. Um, I was going to take you to the provision. The provision is quite clear. It's talking about disputes between Salvor and the owner, so it might be said that can't apply in the case of unclaimed rec. Uh, although it might be said that if unclaimed rec belongs to the Crown or to somebody else who has a right to unclaimed rec in a particular part of the UK. <coughs> um, but that was one proposal. Um, there was a, another, it was subsection 3 of section 547 in the 1894 Act um, that said disputes, if not, if not dealt with by agreement or... Um, agreement or arbitration or otherwise shall be dealt with by the court in the following way. Um, it, it was that provision in particular that I was referring to um, as not having a, a counterpart in the modern act. We, we, we have the other statutes defining the jurisdiction <coughs> of the Admiralty Court um, that are said to be the replacement of that provision. The thing that hasn't been replaced is the imperative shall. This is how it shall be determined by a court. Um, and that's where I said the equivalent was the salvage convention, which says only in judicial or arbitration proceedings, and it only talks about uh, proceedings before a tribunal that is the replacement for that provision that said it shall be determined by a court. Um, it was also in that provision um, that said salvage proceedings can be brought by either the salvor or the owner. Sorry, that was subsection 3. Um, the skeleton argument refers to that in connection with the question of whether an action for delivery up has to be brought. Um, what, what is said in the skeleton is that if the owner wants to get the property back before the expiry of the limitations period, if the salvor doesn't bring proceedings, um, it may seem unfair if there's no possibility of any proceedings being brought by the owner, um, but that there may be different kinds of proceedings that could be brought. It may be that the, uh, the owner could it itself um, bring a salvage claim. That seemed to be expressly provided for in the 1894 Act. Um, why does Section 547 have no counterpart in the 19... 95 Act, um, I, I'm instructed probably because of these other provisions like Section 20 of the 1981 Act, that seems to be the point that everyone has got to. Um, what was the meaning of the proviso in Section 20, Subsection 7 of the Supreme Court Act? That was addressed um, by my friend this morning and um, the suggestion uh, that, that I was instructed with is much the same. Um, and then finally, would the receiver of REC be exercising a judicial function under the State Immunity Act if the receiver did have the power to determine the amount of the salvage award? Um, the answer to that is the interveners don't intervene in relation to state immunity issues, so they don't take a position on that, other than to note that a function can be judicial for purposes of one statute or not another. So it might be possible that it's a judicial function for purposes of the State Immunity Act, even if it wouldn't otherwise be judicial for purposes of other statutes. Um, the point is the receiver of REC submissions have been put on the basis of the interpretation of the Merchant Shipping Act. The receiver uh, or the interveners haven't relied on the State Immunity Act as such, other than to say the interpretation of the Merchant Shipping Act shouldn't be influenced or flavoured by concerns about state immunity. Um, and unless I can assist further, those are my submissions in reply. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, as we've indicated, we'll... Are you ready? With, all right. I, I, 
I was just going to ask an indulgence in that my learned friend has raised a, a, an argument in relation to section 227, uh, which I uh, didn't understand him to have raised before, and I didn't want the court to be under any misapprehension in relation to 227, but I would need an indulgence to uh, raise it. Uh, why don't you put it in writing? My Lord, I was going to ask for one brief indulgence to point out thought my learned friend was going to build, but he didn't. May, may I have an indulgence? Will I? You may. Uh, in, in writing, 4 p.m. Monday. Yes. My Lord, may we have an indication as to what the, the issue is? Um, you, can, you, can talk, you can talk about I'm that sorry. between yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> as we've indicated, we will uh, reserve our judgments. They'll be handed down in the usual way. You're all, I hope, fully aware of the strictness of the requirements in relation to who conceived a draft and for what purposes, uh, administrative corrections of, of, of facts or typographical errors only, no re-arguing, uh, and uh, then uh, we'd also like the parties at that stage to seek to agree uh, any consequential orders, uh, and if you can't agree them, uh, have your rival submissions in writing and we'll determine them. Uh, it'll be handed down uh, as is now the usual way electronically. Um, I, I should say we are very grateful to the parties for the, for the submissions. Um, that, that's not just addressed to uh, council or even those in the front row. I know that, that uh, what, what, what eventually emerges before the court uh, is the product of a good deal of hard work on everybody's part. So we're very, we're very grateful.